In today's lecture, we're covering two gram-positive genera, the Crinibacterium and Rhodococcus. The Crinibacterium cause important diseases in human and veterinary medicine, and one species, Crinibacterium diphtherae, is controlled with a prototypical toxoid vaccine. Both the crinibacteria and rhodococcus are biocontainment level 2 organisms. Morphologically, our rhodococcus are described as being gram-positive coccobacilli, while crinibacterium species are gram-positive club-shaped rods that are typically arranged into a characteristic palisade or Chinese letter formation. These bacteria are aerobic and facultative anaerobes. The colony morphology of Crinibacterium species is variable, depending on which organism we're evaluating, while Rhodococcus equi produces pinkish colonies on blood agar. Um, this pigment can be enhanced using differential media. Importantly, Rhodococcus equi is a facultative intracellular parasite. Here you can see a pure culture of Rhodococcus equi on blood agar at a macro level and then up close, and I think you can appreciate the colonies are white and somewhat wet looking and are described as having a milk drop appearance. Here's a gram stain of a pure culture of Rhodococcus, and you can see these small gram positive coccobacilli. In this cytology preparation, we have abdominal fluid from an animal with a Carinibacterium infection. Here, I think you can appreciate the uh, irregularly shaped, club shaped gram positive rods that are classical of Carinibacterium species. All of these organisms are part of the normal microbiota. They're found on the skin, the mucous membranes, and the intestinal tract, although they're all able to survive in the environment. Crinibacterium pseudotuberculosis has been found to be able to survive for up to 55 days, while Rhodococcus equi is not only a member of the normal microbiota, but also a soil organism and survives quite nicely in soil contaminated with feces. Overall, we have 156 species of Carinibacterium and 55 species of Rhodococcus. These can be differentiated not only morphologically, but using the oxidative fermentative test, with Carinibacterium being fermentative. Carinibacterium can then be subdivided based on the CAMP test. Carinibacterium pseudotuberculosis, which is a very important veterinary pathogen, is CAMP negative. While the Carinibacterium renale group, which causes urinary tract infections, are CAMP positive. Within the C. renale group, Pelosum, Cystitidis, and renale can be differentiated based on their co colony color and morphology. The Carinibacterium renale group all cause urinary tract infections, and so when we think about their virulence factors, the presence of urease makes a lot of sense. This is an enzyme which allows the production of ammonia from urea. Remember, that's the nitrogenous waste of mammals. And it provides these organisms with a valuable source of nitrogen. They also produce pili, which facilitate attachment to the uroepithelium. Crinibacterium pseudotuberculosis produces phospho phospholipase D, which is an essential virulence factor. Experimentally, strains which are deficient in phospholipase C have been shown to be incapable of causing the classical Carinibacterium pseudotuberculosis lesions. Phospholipase C damages host cell membranes and facilitates spread. It's also cytotoxic to erythrocytes and neutrophils. Rhodococcus equi produces VAPs or virulence associated proteins. VAP A is one which is known to be particularly important for its pathogenesis in equine infections. And it allows the organisms to survive intracellularly by preventing uh, acidification of the phagosome. And then finally, Carinibacterium diphtherae is a canonical toxigenic infection. The toxin produced by this organism interferes with our own protein synthesis, and that's the mechanism by which it causes disease. The disease, of course, being diphtheria, which has been described as early as the 5th century BCE. Diphtheria toxin is actually one of the most uh, well-studied bacterial toxins. The toxoid vaccine was developed in the 1920s and has been very successful. Crinibacterium pseudotuberculosis is perhaps most notably the cause of caseous lymphadenitis in sheep and goats, but also camels. 
It also causes mastitis in cattle. The Carinibacterium renale group are all associated with urinary tract infections of one form or another. So C. renale causes pyelonephritis and cystitis in cattle. In pigs, we see kidney abscesses. And in male sheep, we see bolanopostitis, um, so inflammation of the penis and prepuce, um, colloquially known as pizzle rot. Carinibacterium cystitidis and Carinibacterium pilosum both cause cystitis and pyelonephritis in cattle. Rhodococcus equi causes a variety of syndromes in horses, depending on how old they are. In foals from 4 to 12 weeks, we classically see bronchopneumonia, while in older animals, we see abscessation. And then finally, Carinibacterium diphtheriae causes diphtheria in people. Starting off with Carinibacterium pseudotuberculosis, this is the cause of caseous lymphadenitis. So caseating lesions are a form of coagulation necrosis where we have caseous material, so resembling cheese at the center of the abscess. These abscesses are pyogranulomatous and can be found in the lymph nodes and abdominal viscera. And the material within these lymph nodes becomes thickened and inspissated, dried out, it's poorly vascularized, and so it's difficult to get antimicrobials at adequate concentrations into the center of the abscess. These infections are highly contagious, and it's difficult to eradicate once the herd is infected. Caseous lymphadenitis has a worldwide distribution. In North America, the region with the highest incidence is apparently California. The Carinibacterium renale group cause infections of the bovine urinary tract, so whether it's renale, cystitidis, or pilosum. In cystitis, so infection of the urinary bladder, cattle are typically not systemically sick. Clinically, you may see hematuria, so blood in the urine, and proteinuria, protein in the urine, if you were to do a urine biochemistry analysis. Pyelonephritis is infection of the kidney, and these animals are sick. Clinical signs include uh, depression, reduced feed intake, and they're also going to be febrile, so they'll have a fever. This organism is maintained in the herd by subclinical carriers and diseased animals, and it's transmitted between individuals by essentially splashing urine droplets. So it splashes from one cow onto the vulva of an, another susceptible cow and ascends the urinary tract in that way. The way to control this disease is to isolate affected animals. It's quite difficult to eradicate from infected herds once it's present. Attachment of these organisms is facilitated by alkaline conditions and inhibited by acid. So urease not only liberates uh, nitrogen from urea, but the ammonia that's produced also increases the pH of the urine. Urinary acidification may therefore be helpful in controlling these infections. From an antimicrobial perspective, penicillin would be the treatment of choice. As the disease progresses, the likelihood of treatment success decreases. So cystitis is much more likely to be successfully treated than would be pyelonephritis, as that infection ascends, the prognosis goes down. And it's been reported that the call rate for affected animals is up to about one third. In this cytological preparation here um, from some bovine urine, you can see a, uh, a urinary uh, epithelial cell that's desquamated with these small uh, club-like structures. These are the Carinibacterium organisms, and you can see them forming that characteristic palisade or Chinese letter formation. Here's another image that's perhaps even a little bit clearer. Again, you can see our club-shaped rods forming these palisade-like agglomerations. Melanopostitis in sheep, so inflammation of the penis and prepuce, is colloquially known as pizzle rot. And this is a disease that's predisposed by high protein diets. Um, the more protein that's consumed, the more urea is going to have to be excreted as nitrogenous waste in the urine. And of course, as carinibacteria are urease producers, that urea is converted to ammonia by the organism. The ammonia, this high pH uh, molecule, irritates the penis. It causes inflammation and ulceration. Bacteria are then able to invade those compromised tissues, and ultimately we get scarring over the prepuce, which prevents penile extrusion and therefore breeding. So this is a clear uh, production-limiting disease 
In addition to, of course, being an animal welfare issue, treating bolanoplastitis in rams is, uh, relies on a combination of antimicrobials, so generally penicillin, debriding the dead tissue, and removing excess wool from the site of infection. In companion animals, the role of bacteria in disease is unclear. Um, a positive culture really needs to be interpreted in the context of the patient. Skin infections caused by Carinibacterium oris canis and Carinibacterium ulcerans have been reported, but these are frequently polymicrobial infections, and so it's unclear as to which organisms are necessarily actually causing the pathology in each case. Treatment can also be quite challenging, so this may be another instance where consultation with a dermatologist would be useful. Rarely, we see urinary tract infections in our companion animals caused by Carinibacterium urealyticum. 